<laughs> hey, Grill fam, what's up? It's your girl, Natasha. We are live from our studio in New York City, and I am honored to welcome you to our panel about celebrating the fullness of diversity. Hello, everybody. Hey. Welcome. Hey. Thank you, thank you. You know, we're talking about diversity today, but it's not just about any diversity. It's within the context of HBCUs. We're celebrating HBCU spring coming. Shout yes, out to yes, the yes, spring hey. coming cute, uh, crew. And we also are celebrating the National Black Justice Coalition, which is doing incredible work to support the LGBTQ community, same gender loving people. This is a great conversation we're having. So first, yeah. let's welcome the panel. Happy to have David Johns, the executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition in the thank building. You. Welcome, you. David. Thank you. Thank Welcome, you. Amani Hope. She is an HBCU alum, education leader, and an ally as well. Welcome, Amani. And welcome Nala Toussaint. She is a trans activist. She has a lot to say about education, particularly mm -hmm. HBCUs. So welcome, Nala. And of course, welcome to Michael Arsenault. Thank you for having Author, me. Author, writer, Beyonce lover. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <In that> water. <laughs> HBCU alum and also the author of I Can't Date Jesus, his yes. forthcoming memoir. So welcome, everybody. Thank Thank you. You. Good Thank to see you. So you know, so I want to open this conversation by asking about the importance of supporting the LGBTQ community within the context of HBCUs. Why is it important to be inclusive and to appreciate diversity? And I'm going to start off kicking that to David since you are leading this initiative. I appreciate that. And I first want to say thank you again to you, Natasha, for creating a space for us yeah. to, to do this, right? This is really important. Um, the National Black Justice Coalition exists to highlight the intersections of civil rights or our blackness as well as LGBTQ SGL equity or the ways in which we also show up with other intersections. Um, and so I also want to shout out George and Lauren, the founders of Spring Coming, uh, because now that this is their fourth year, um, and they thought it was really important to have a conversation about ensuring that we celebrate the fullness of the diversity that exists in our community, right? Um, I've said before on this platform that as long as there have been black people, there have been black LGBTQIA+, as well as black same gender loving people. Um, and to that point, we live where other black people live, right? Uh, we go to HBCUs, we go to black churches, we show up in black spaces because we are black. Mm -hmm. And so unless we create spaces where we can talk about that, which is often rendered invisible, mm -hmm. otherwise neglected or ignored, we miss opportunities to really celebrate um, um, both the challenges and the many ways in which we show up and we show out. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So what do you feel like the climate has been like? I know every single HBCU is different. It has its own culture. But in what ways have um, LGBTQ people been supported within HBCUs? And how do you think we can continue to improve it? Um, I'm going to be honest. Um, my experience at Howard, I love Howard University to death. Um, in terms of being gay was not the best experience. Um, but when, when I got there, I was struggling with myself when I came out. Um, also, I want to say when I got there the freshman year, a gay guy had been jumped by the band, and mm -hmm. in the Morehouse, the young man was beat with a bat in the shower. So you can imagine what the climate was like. I'm always very particular about mm -hmm. trying to level criticism within the community because I don't want us to be made the boogeyman of homophobia and transphobia the way the mainstream er the narrative excuse me, tends to be. But I will say, um, if not for black women, I don't think I would have kind of gotten through. I think black women were more supportive at the time than my fellow gay and queer bisexual um, men, but I also understand the climate. Mm -hmm. It was a lot different then, and it was interesting um, doing an event with David in the fall, um, which I kind of knew because there are people who, you know, after college they reached out, some even apologized for how they were. So I understood. Yeah, gross. Um, yes. But also there's, there's a freedom there that didn't exist when I was there. Yeah. And I'm realizing I'm becoming an old head. Um, but there are still some issues in there. But I, I will say it's better, and I am encouraged by that. Um, but I also know my experience is different from other people's. But yeah. mine was kind of, you know, 50-50. But shout out to black women for holding me down once I was comfortable with myself. Because that made it Shout out to black women. Black yeah. women. Yeah. Yeah. Black Taking women. the lead. Black women. Where, where do you think the progress has come from? What, what has kind of uh, been a catalyst for some of the progress that we've seen? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I'm going to speculate a bit here because it's been <clears throat> some years since I was uh, uh, in, in school. Um, but I think that, you know, what I've seen in terms of the progress that's happened on, like, FAMU's campus, um, I think a lot of that has spawned from just a general movement of young people 
towards activism mm -hmm. and a general movement of young people towards um, this idea of intersectionality and this this concept of you know the the struggles that that I face and the struggles that you face um, may have a lot more in common than we recognize and I think that that t has tended to open people up to recognizing you know struggles of of those who are not necessarily like them um, even when within the context of black people at an HBCU and so I've seen a lot more a lot just a lot more of that like um, activist spirit and that idea of like we have got to fight for all of us um, right. because it's not enough to fight for just exactly who I identify as or who I who I think I represent um, and so I think that you know Black Lives Matter and um, just this this resurgence um, of of that activism um, on campuses has um, led to a lot of that um, that opening of the dialogue and that bringing in of of all all people. For Still sure. a lot of work to do. To your point, yeah, um, yeah. for sure. Nala, why do you think it is important mm -hmm. to to fight for everyone? That mm -hmm. the concept of caring about everyone so we can all be free. Mm -hmm. Why Why is that important? Yeah, I often think about like who my people are. So like uh, my people being trans folks who often aren't in the conversation, right, who often experience school push out, mm -hmm. right? This conversation is so important because you give access, right? When we're thinking about political climate, right? Mm -hmm. Policy laws that does not celebrate trans folks particularly. It's important when you have school who are going against the grain, especially when we know how students in their self when it comes to black community fought it to be in school. So mm -hmm. what it looks like to mirror that advocacy and create space for trans folks who are experienced, especially the intersectionality of black trans individuals to be in school. Right. Wow, right. that's something. Just thinking about that imagery of us fighting just to even be in college. Right. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Especially at HBCUs. Mm -hmm. right? Right. right. Institutions that were created for us. But, you know, NBJC has been in the, in the work of helping to support cultural competency at HBCUs for more than a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we started the conversation, mm -hmm. not, not me literally, um, but when the organization started the conversation, so many university presidents would say with a straight face, we don't, we don't have those students here. Wow, wow. wait, they really said that? They thought that there were no? Yes, oh, wow. with a straight that's, face, that's right? And, 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 and think about it, for, for someone who um, exists in um, black spaces where we don't have these conversations, right? Mm -hmm. Where the idea is, think about it in, in the black church, right? Where we accept that the, the, the choir director may n never be married, but we just not going to talk about right. it, right? The, the director, that's his private business, that's, right? right mm -hmm. That's his private business. Right. And, and, and as long as, uh, to, to Nala's point about even expanding that space, as long as he shows up understanding the politics of presentation in this space, we're going to be good. Policy. Mm -hmm. right. Politics, right, right, right. So, so that happens at HBC as well. We also don't have data, right? We don't, we don't have the language, right? Like we don't, SGL is not a term, or same gender loving mm -hmm. is not a term that institutions mm -hmm. are creating, which is why it's so important for yes. institutions like Bennett College and Spelman right. to acknowledge, as Iyala says, you got to name a thing a thing, beloved, right? Like mm -hmm. we have to be able to call things out and be able to call people in. I think that so much of the connection between what everybody said and the answer to your question, Natasha, is that we are doing this work because we have to. Yeah, that's like, right. too many of us are dying. Yes. Like, all of this response to living in a world where we have to literally defend our humanity, mm -hmm. right? Can't sit in a Starbucks while being black, right? Can't go, mm -hmm. like, so many things that, that, that are continuing to happen and people are just tired of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think understanding that none of us are free until all of us are free. And then having to deal with the trauma of the, the constant exposure to the reminders that there are so many spaces outside of where we can be ourselves and stand with each other that we are constantly under attack, like, is why we have to continue to do this. So you're pushing for, oh, I'm sorry, I was just going to ask, you're pushing for cultural competency. What does that mean for, like, in plain uh, English <laughs> for yeah, folks who it, don't it, understand? It, 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 for us, it looks like sitting down with, this actually just happened, and I want to give a shout out to Howard University. I also want to give a shout out to the young people at Howard who were thoughtful enough to sit in a space and, and, and take up space and make That's some right. demands, right? But the leadership of Howard University um, for the last several weeks has been going through cultural competency training. What that means is that um, uh, senior administration, everybody from the principal staff on down to the leaders of the athletics departments, uh, housing, uh, food services, all of the individual schools and colleges, uh, sit down and have a conversation about the fact that we exist in these spaces and unless and until you are mindful of that 
and are equipped with the language, the tools, and the resources to support us, to understand the unique needs that we have or the challenges that we otherwise face when we're ignored, you'll continue to neglect the responsibility you have to serve all of your students. Mm -hmm. So an example of that is saying, while there are some gender neutral bathrooms on this campus for individuals who might not identify as male or female, right, which is another thing we have to talk about. Those bathrooms can't all be in the basement of spaces where they can't, people can't access them, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it's talking about the fact that if there's a policy around protecting students and ensuring that you can't harass a student or abuse them physically in any way, shape, or form, and it, and it refers to race, it refers to gender, it also has to refer to sexual preference and orientation, right? We have to name these things within our spaces where we also are fighting externally as well. Yeah, and Monty. Yeah, I was just going to say that it kind of, melts perfectly into David's comments is that like I know one of the reasons why my um, aside from the fact that it was just tradition but I know one of the reasons why my parents were um, really adamant about me attending an HBCU was mm -hmm. the fact that in addition to just seeing so many black people um, it was also a space where you could learn a lot but also unlearn so many of the things that you know going up through traditional public education, you may think are, you know, it's our facts and it's the truth. And it's a place um, where I think students are able to learn um, about themselves and mm -hmm. unlearn so much of the um, just wrong information, wrong history um, that we're fed when, you know, in, in K through 12. And I think that that's also an important role when we're talking about um, the LGBTQ community is like, HBCUs can serve as a place for that learning and that unlearning, and that's why the cultural competency is so important. Mm -hmm. It's not just about people being students next to you in a classroom and, and the access. It's also about, like, how are we learning the things we don't know, and how are we unlearning the things we think we know, and so that we can move and navigate through the world as informed people um, and as inclusive people. And so um, I think that, that the cultural competency piece for the staff and for the administration, um, for the professors, is just as important as making sure that there is you know, access and, and, um, and just equitable representation like in the student body. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember um, Sue Chan Pak? So I I participated in a domestic exchange at Howard, right? I graduated from Columbia University, but took some time off. And while I was a student at Howard, uh, Grotergratz and Bollinger, the Supreme Court case was being tried. I was a student journalist. I, we you know we slept outside of the courthouse. I walked in, heard Clarence Thomas sell us down the river. Whole other conversation mm -hmm. around affirmative action. I walk outside and Suchin Park put, uh, puts a mic in front of my face and says. What's it like to go from a place that is so diverse like Columbia to a place like Howard? Oh, that's annoying. Oh. And, and beyond annoying, I, I thought about it and responded like, while Columbia is the most diverse Ivy League school in this country, there are all types of black people yes. that show up at, at yes. Howard, right? Like yes. this idea that we're all a monolith and don't, mm -hmm. like, the, the diversity is important, right? Mm -hmm. Sitting to, in Greg's to your Park. Point, we had class together. Um, <laughs> the, right. <laughs> um, one thing I always say about Howard was that it's the most diverse place I've ever been. Period. Because I didn't realize so many different types of black but, people existed. Mm -hmm. And I come from, like, not a background where a lot of people went to college. Like, frankly, no one went to college. So I'm like, me and my sister are kind of like the first. Mm -hmm. So when I got there, honestly, at first I was like, oh, these are like TV show black people. Um, like, these are black people I didn't really understand. People from like my own metropolitan area in Houston, they looked at me like, how are you here? But then I met more people. But I saw so many different facets of blackness. And I've been in plenty of white spaces to work. But Howard is this, you got to see all of us. So like, that's when I say annoying. It's kind of like a very easy way of saying it. But that, that's a frustrating response because there's so much of us. And to this point about kind of just acknowledging LGBTQ, SWV, and make sure I get all the letters <laughs> out of people. Um, I tried it, I know. And then I always go back to, when I talk about media narratives, like, I always go back to these Pew studies that show like black people self-identify as LGBTQIA, I actually got it right that time, um, more than white people do and have for several years. So it's like we've always been there. It's just important like we acknowledge that teach people the language. Language that frankly I didn't even know. I had to learn on my own like through work and through friends but we, it's like we're there but you don't know what you don't know. Absolutely and speaking of that learning, oh yeah, go yeah, ahead. And I was also saying like and we identify in so, so many other languages right that are not connected to LGBT but we either, 
understand that our ancestors use different language, mm -hmm. right? That in the context of when we're talking about language, how our oppressor often took that language from us, right? Mm -hmm. So how easy we are often to put like stipulations of what fullness of blackness is, but not connecting it to how our oppressors came in and took our language and everything that we know so that we don't even celebrate our fullness, right? We put stipulations of what blacks fullness is supposed to be, right? And so imagine all of that happening at the same time for mm -hmm. students in particular, but there are some faculty members and deans and mm -hmm. senior administrators who have existed in these spaces for decades, yeah. right? Who were not engaged in these conversations, who are not connected to young folks who are moving in this way. And so what could happen is you can have somebody who's at a law school and says that in this industry, there's a way that you have to perform. And if you don't, then you might not get the job. And so one thing that we've experienced is someone talking about counseling students to not be gay in interviews. Mm -hmm. We should all be asking in this moment, like, what does that even mean? Exactly. Right? Like, am I, am, I, am I walking in saying that I, that I have a wife or something? But, but, but this is a, a, a frame of reference that yeah. so many people have. And if you as a student are seeking the counsel of people who are in spaces where they're supposed to be loving and protecting and guiding you, and this is the information you're receiving, it can be conflicting, it can cause all kind of trauma, it, it, it can exacerbate the things that happen in the world simply because we're black. And so, so much of what is important for me in the work that we're doing is creating space, literally, for people to adopt the language, to be able to talk to one another, and for us to be able to remind people that unless we, unless and until we all do this work together, mm -hmm. none of us are going to be free. Yes. Well, we are creating this space right now on The Griot Live. If you are tuning in, we're having this incredible panel discussion about celebrating the fullness of diversity. Shout out to HBCU Spring Coming, which is yes. going down this weekend in New York City. So excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. And also the National Black Justice Coalition, who is leading this work. So I want to ask this question, you know, Michael talked about black women um, really stepping up and being a, a circle of support and love. What does it mean to be an ally mm -hmm. for students who maybe don't understand? This is their, their first time uh, having conversations about inclusion and diversity. How, how are you a good ally to someone? Go ahead, friend. <laughs> 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 see how David just like <laughs> leaned in. Um, so I mean, first of all, I'll preface this by saying that I in no way think that I am um, exemplary as an ally, you right? Are. So, um, and to that point, I think the first important piece of being an ally is recognizing that, like, you have a lot to learn and that um, you need to be in a constant space of willingness to learn and willingness to have people right. call you out or as my friends will say, call, call you, you in, in. Mm -hmm. um, on with love, yeah. right? Yeah. On the things that that you need to, to know and, and ways that you need to readjust. And so um, I think for me, um, it has been a really important part of my just development and my growth as a woman and as a black woman to um, to be an ally to the LGBTQ community, like it has been, it has taught me so much about myself. Um, it has taught me so much about my own limitations, uh, and it has exposed me to um, to really so much um, just you know beauty and grace and and the ways in which um, my friends and my family have who are LGBTQ um, have had so much patience with me and and in ways that I probably wouldn't have patience with someone else who, you know, was trying to be an ally. Like, I don't know if I'd have that kind of patience with, you know, my white allies. I'd be like, get it together. How long is this going to take? Like, come on, use your Google. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that, that the, the allyship piece is so important and that's why when we're talking about diversity at HBCUs, you know, you can't learn mm -hmm. that you can't learn that if you are not around people who are different from you. You can't be <coughs> um, be open to allyship. You can't grow in your allyship if you are not conscious of, you know, the differences that are existing around you or if those differences aren't around you. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that that is why it's critical for um, for HBCUs to be a place for that to happen, right? And to help do the work to develop people into strong allies. Um, 
So, no. Yeah, no. I, I was I, I was gonna um, uplift like oh, I, I and I heard you loud and clear. Uh, I think oftentimes about like my mom and, and our relationship, right? Like at the first. Uh, <laughs> first generation American from Caribbean descent, right? My mom is from Jamaica and what it took for our relationship building, right? And I'm, I'm being very intentional and in, in naming like Jamaican mom, right? Mm -hmm. And what sure. that means. To what ask, did she struggle with? Right, what, what right. was her? But not even necessarily struggle because I think often that is the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. That there is a struggle rather than how do I lean in? Mm -hmm. So there how, were questions more so. Right. Mm -hmm. How do I uh, uh, relearn, unlearn mm -hmm. what I've been taught, mm -hmm. right? How do I say what do you need? So often the conversation that we built between one another was help me help you help me. Right. Right. So that there's an exchange of energy. Mm -hmm. Right. So while you have learned this foundation, you have to understand where that foundation comes from. And my mom was so key on even teaching me how to love my blackness, but she understood that trans, a uh, same gender loving people existed way before uh, colonization. Right. Mm -hmm. So she, she got that piece. So she was very patient. Right. Although there were pieces that there were some bumps. It was like, wait, I don't know. I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. uh, but she got uncomfortable with being comfortable. And that's beautiful that you could actually mm -hmm. talk together Absolutely. and grow together. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Beyonce snatched all of our edges. Come on, um, not an edge at <laughs> Coachella. I don't know how you guys are recovering. But she gave this beautiful tribute to HBCUs and HBCU culture. And I just want us to, as we're like wrapping up the panel, just talk about what we love about the HBCU experience. Mm -hmm. Whether you went there for four years, whether you were there for you know a visit, um, <laughs> whether someone in your family has attended, what is it about HBCUs that is such a beautiful experience for black students? Mm. Well, there's so much, um, but I, I will try to be brief. I mean, I um, was talking with a friend as we all were after watching that performance, right? It was like the talk of the week. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I was saying that, like, to me, HBCU culture and all of the things that Beyonce captured in that performance is something that is so uniquely black. It is so, every aspect of it is so uniquely black. And so whether you went to an HBCU, whether you, you know, have family who went to an HBCU, everyone, most black people, have some connection to HBCUs and so can, could, could relate to what they were seeing on the screen in such a deep way. Um, and that's powerful. You know, we aren't a monolith, but to have something that, like, we could all watch and be like, yo, that reminds me of whatever, um, it's just very, very powerful, and I think that um, the I want to see HBCUs thrive and continue to thrive for another hundred years and beyond that. And I want them, sorry, mm -hmm. I want them to do that in an inclusive way. I That's want right. them to do that in a way that is going to be supportive and um, and 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 just a space of of growth and learning for all. All of us, um, and and I know that for me, my experience there, um, just you know, it just solidified my blackness. Mm -hmm. Like you know, I was I loved being black before, but going to an HBCU was just like the certified 100% stamp mm -hmm. on the blackness. And so it's FAMU, um, right? Shout out to FAMU. <laughs> Let them know. Shout out to the Rattlers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I, I think that's really for me the significance of of HBCUs. I think for me, just from being from Houston, like it was, it, it was home. It was high school. It was college. Um, but I think one thing with Beyonce, which honestly I don't know if people give her no credit for, this, she's always been pulling from different aspects of Black culture. Mm -hmm. What was then referred to as sissy bounce, you can see that in B Day, which comes from Black queer people. Um, the mm -hmm. bands, the mm -hmm. stuff. I think mm -hmm. how it reminds me of HBC when that Beyonce does not center anything but her experience, and she is a Black mm -hmm. woman. She does not care about the white gays. She does not. Mm -hmm concern herself with whether or not they will get it. She does like with what I have to do when I'm watching something, what they do, I'll, or read something, I'll, like, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. The same way she's not focused on them, she's not fixated on them. That reminds me of what it was like to be at Howard, to be in a place where like, mm -hmm. I got to learn within the diversity of us, I got to experience us, I got to be a part of us, good and bad, mm -hmm. mostly just great, but um, she, again, she just focuses on herself and she ignores white people. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's only just because you don't have to, but you don't have to, I literally have a sentence in my book that says what, I don't really care about white people like that. And what I mean is I'm not centering myself or basing anything about what I think based on what the whiteness and white reflection says of that. Now that's what I think about Beyonce. 
And that's actually what got me about that performance. Like, I was literally just talking to my college friends, my high school friends. Everybody from Houston was just like, oh, this is us. And we're not mm -hmm. really worried about yeah. what they're thinking. They either get it or they don't. And that made me really happy because, for me, it was just a culmination of what her career has always been. I can shout. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's it. To exist in a world that hates you because of who you are is a traumatic thing. And there are very few spaces for us where we can seek a kind of refuge that is soul food, right? Like soul filling, soul stirring, soul affirming. Mm -hmm. And HBCUs do that, right? Like it, it, they are for so many of us, whether it's a annual trip to a homecoming or the, the, the stories you hear around, around the family and, 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 and alums or being there and living in it, it, it it's Wakanda. <laughs> right in a in a, in a in a society where every day we are battling colonizers right and and so I I just want to celebrate all of the institutions uh, and the young people at the institutions and and not so young people at the institutions that are holding them accountable for continuing to be spaces where we can gather the tools and and, and spend the time restoring ourselves to be able to show up in the world and uh, unless we acknowledge that th this is the work, right? Outside of HBCUs, the work that we have to do is having these conversations, learning how to stand better together, mm -hmm. overcoming all of the challenges against black and brown and, and immigrant and non-native people. Unless we do that work, we will continue to struggle and suffer. And it doesn't have to be that way. So I again just want to say thank you to all of y'all, yeah. right? To all of the students who are, are, yes. are, are taking up space, yes. speaking full truth to power. Yeah. I want to say thank you to organizations like Walmart. Walmart sure. just gave a huge investment to NBJC that will allow us to continue this work, right? Like, that is what's required for us to endure living in a world with Klan president where we can sometimes celebrate the importance of having Queen Bee. Mm. Wow, that's it. Anything you want to add about the, I mean, we've, we've talked about it all. I didn't go to an HBCU, but I was shaped by HBCUs. The leaders in my community were graduates of HBCUs who studied with us and tutored with us and took us on trips to NAACP AXO. So it's just like, it's all part of the community. Yeah, like when I was in high school, I remember um, first from HBCUs, like came Deltas, came mm -hmm. to uplift me, like in ways to teach me about how to prepare for school. Right, and we're talking about me growing up in Brooklyn and, and like really learning about that, but also where I can actually, I didn't have to name my identity. I could just be, and they were able to accept the femininity, right? Mm -hmm. They were able to say, celebrate and say, no, that means you still get to go to school. Mm -hmm. That means you still get to be great, right? And I think that's a language that we need to focus on, the affirmations, right? Yes. That in your yes. fullness that you still get to be great because mm -hmm. you're a part of this community. That's right. Mm -hmm. that's right. That is a perfect note to end on. Wow. <laughs> black excellence. One, like one shout for black excellence. Yeah. Yes. It's okay. Just celebrated today. Well, I'm so happy that you all came through. Thank you for stopping through. Thank this you. was great. Oh, this was so fun. And big shout out to HBCU Spring Con Coming. Yes. If you are watching right now, make sure be you hit there. them up on Instagram. Be there, buy tickets, yes. show up. It's a great all time. Of that. Stand with Absolutely, stand with black women <laughs> all, all the time. And also make sure that you check out the National Black Justice Coalition, which is also on Instagram as well, doing great work. And the hashtag for this week is HBCU Spring Coming 18 or HBC Union. Make sure that you check out those hashtags over the weekend. And of course, hit share at the bottom of this video. Spread the knowledge, spread the love. And thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye.